Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this WoundCon Innovation Theater, Innovations in Wound Hygiene, Illuminating What Our Eyes Cannot See, sponsored by Moleculite. My name is Amy McCauley, and I am a managing editor for WoundSource, the creators of WoundCon. I want to thank you for participating in today's pre-conference webinar. WoundCon will be held on March 11th. We have a full day of CME sessions, posters, exhibits, live product demonstrations, Q&A sessions, and so much more planned for you. If you won't be able to attend the, the full conference, don't worry, WoundCon will be available on demand until 12 p.m. Eastern time on March 25th. Our speakers this morning are going to discuss wound hygiene and the use of fluorescent imaging using the Moleculite point of care device to aid in wound cleansing and biofilm management. Before we get started, I just want to review a few things about your webinar console with you. In the resources app found on the right of your screen, you'll find a list of downloadable resources provided by our sponsor. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide view, or by clicking and dragging the lower right-hand corner of your slide view. If you experience any technical difficulties, please click on the help icon in the tray on the bottom of your screen. This should help to resolve common technical issues. To learn more about our speakers, you can select and expand the bio app found on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll conclude this morning's session with a Q&A session, so please submit any questions using the Q&A app, also located on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can. For any other comments or questions related to today's content, please use the Contact Us app to contact the sponsor directly. As a reminder, HMP Global does not give medical or reimbursement advice, nor do we provide medical or diagnostic services. The content of today's webinar is for informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed in this webinar and contents are solely those of the presenters and do not represent the views of WoundSource, HMP Global, its affiliates, or subsidiary companies. Our disclaimer statement can be accessed in full in the resources section of your console. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this morning's session, Dot Weir and Dr. Lee Rootsey. Dot is in practice at the Saratoga Hospital Center for Wound Healing and Hyperbaric Medicine. She is also the co-chair of the Symposium on Advanced Wound Care and the founding editor of today's Wound Clinic. Dr. Rootsey is the medical director of the Saratoga Hospital Center for Wound Healing and Hyperbaric Medicine, as well as the clinical assistant professor of medicine at the State of University of New York at Buffalo in wound care and hyperbaric medicine. Dot and Dr. Rootsey, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Emmy, and thank you everyone for joining us. It's uh, exciting to be here. This has been a, a wonderfully fun work in progress, uh, getting to uh, our, our time with you tonight. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> There we go. Uh, so these are just some sort of standard disclaimers. You know, these are all our patients, I will tell you that. And they, the, all this filming was done at our center with all the appropriate um, consents done. Anything else you wanna say? Well, yes, I, I, uh, I also want to uh, give a shout out to Rob and Monique and all of the team from uh, uh, Moleculite for giving Dot and I the opportunity to do this uh, project with you. There was uh, a tremendous amount of effort on, uh, uh, on the part of Moleculite uh, to come to Saratoga to do this with us. So we are so grateful for that. Uh, also, um, I certainly uh, want to express some gratitude to uh, uh, Peter Hopper, Kristen Mosher, and the Saratoga Hospital Senior Leadership Team for their support in the development and implementation of this project, uh, which was uh, filmed uh, in our new wound center up here in uh, upstate New York, Saratoga Springs, New York. So uh, thanks to all, as well as uh, all of you in the audience tonight. All right, well, let's get started. So I don't know if any of you have ever heard me speak before, but one of the things that's really one of my passions, as well as I will say sort of a soapbox, is about wound cleansing. And, you know, we think we clean wounds all the time. And so what, why would we ever need to, to change? What is there to change? Well, many times, just as this picture shows, I love this, this uh, picture here. If, if the wound's gonna have a chance, as I hope 
you take away as a messaging today is that uh, you, we have to change the way we approach cleansing. And uh, I, think, I think you're going to believe me by the time this is done. So I was very proud to be part of a group that developed a paper on wound hygiene. And I think everyone, I hope a lot of folks have heard about this and understand uh, the reasoning behind it, because it really needs to be a fundamental aspect of the care that we give to these patients. It has such a huge role in speeding or, or getting the wound healing process starting, preventing complications like infections, uh, adding to drainage, adding to odor, adding to pain. Um, and we know these wounds are fragile. They're, they're like flower gardens. We have to tend to them. And so if we want them to grow, we're going to have to make sure we treat them well. And so we can address delayed healing if we have the right tools. Uh, but first and foremost, of course, starting with having the right etiology of the wounds in general. And I, I would uh, just throw in that this is, has not been something that's been part of classic wound care teaching throughout the years. So, um, you know, in as much as wound care is a, an ever evolving science and practice, I, I think that this has been a really, really important development, uh, wound hygiene. So there's some basic pillars to the wound hygiene, which we'll get to, but one of the strategies within that is getting cleansing, uh, cleansing appropriately, getting the cleansing done well. And through the use of the moleculite, it has really helped us to identify the areas of the wound. And I think what you'll see and be surprised at is of the peri wound. And so we're gonna talk about a various approaches that we take to accomplishing wound hygiene. And so the wound hygiene pillars are cleansing the wound, debriding the wound, making sure that we're watching the wound edges and refashing them if needed, and then treating with an appropriate dressing. And so we have to rethink this every time we see the patient, because as you know, these wounds are dynamic and they can change from time to time. So one of the, what we're gonna focus on today is just about wound cleansing. And what came out in this paper is the importance that we clean not only the wound bed, but also about had the peri wound area about 10 to 20 centimeters around the wound, or at least where the wound was uh, skin, peri wound skin was covered by the dressing, whichever is larger. And so a lot of people say, well, just clean up to the next joint. So like if it's a, if it's a foot wound then you clean up to the ankle, if it's an ankle wound, clean up to the knee, just make sure we're cleaning the surrounding skin. And I think again, you'll, you'll believe us when we, when we finish with this. So again, we're going to focus on cleansing. Now, what you cleanse with, uh, it takes on two different roles, what you use as a solution and then what you use as an instrument to clean with. We are not going to be talking about solutions. You just want to use something that you feel is going to sufficiently cleanse the wound. My dear friend, Terry Swanson, is the first, she's from Australia. The first time I ever heard someone say this is when you're like just dribbling a little normal saline over a wound and blotting it dry, that's anointing. That's not cleaning a wound. And I took that so to heart and that started me on my journey about wound cleansing. And so we wanna use something that's non-toxic uh, that will adequately clean the wound. Uh, and if you don't need to use something that has antimicrobial or antiseptic uh, properties, then using something that has a surfactant like one of the spray cleansers would be helpful. But we have to clean with with intent, we have to clean with enough um, uh, vigor, if you will, to remove uh, dry skin and, and some of the things that we'll get to. And I would also throw in, uh, in your wound cleansing uh, products, uh, make sure you pay attention to the pH in case any of your other uh, dressings or products have pH limitations. Do that. Do that. Okay. Let's look closely. All right. So um, we have a, a, a wealth of information in terms of studies and papers, and we could spend the entire session just talking about the literature base in support of moleculite. All of these had colony forming units in the order of at least 10 to the fourth CFU per gram of tissue. You're going to hear this number 10 to the fourth a lot as we go on this evening. The second study here uh, the review, this is, this is an extensive literature review uh, showing extensive data supporting microbial interference with wound healing once the bacterial burden again exceeds 10 to the fourth colony forming units per gram of tissue. The trick in all of this is that without a device or instrument such as moleculite, our own clinical sense and judgment of looking at the wound 
our eyeballs don't give us uh, information uh, as accurate as what we need. So this is a, a, a diagram that was borrowed or modified from the International Wound Infection Institute 2016 guidelines, which I will tell you have just been updated. I'm proud to sit on the IWII and our, our panel just updated the uh, guidelines. And so what you're looking at in this diagram was part of the old guidelines. In that five years, so much more information is known now about biofilm. This is our enemy. And so the, this diagram is now in a full page pullout. And so, I mean, the information has just exploded, but the, the, the messaging is still the same. We know as we, as we look at the continuum of bacterial growth, planktonic or just contamination and colonization, we just need to be watching those wounds and doing good wound cleansing. The tipping point is around here where we begin to get a buildup of bacteria. They're beginning to get organized. We'll talk about biofilm in a minute. And the higher the bacterial load goes, then we need, then need to turn to interventions uh, because we need to work at getting that bacteria down. And so we, the world is talking about biofilm. We know it's important. And, and, and it is one of those things that can keep a wound from healing. But what I want to point out in this diagram at, at the, down at the bottom, we all have seen these diagrams of biofilm where we, we point out planktonic and as they become sessile or attached, they become organized. And then they show them sort of growing and they almost look like mushroom-like. So they're, they look like they're things that are sticking up above the tissue. Tom Bar Barnschild, who's also on the IWI, I published a really nice paper talking about the mental model of biofilm where we think we can see them, but we can't. They're microscopic. Uh, they not only are on the surface of the wound, they are penetrated down a few millimeters into the tissues. And so just cleaning some debris and some coagulant that's sitting on the surface is not necessarily removing the biofilm. I think that's an important point when we think about cleansing. So now take a look at all of these pictures. You know, everybody in the audience, I'm sure, has been doing this for a while. We can look at all of these pictures and have some thoughts about which might be colonized, which might be locally infected. Uh, the truth of the matter is, and Moleculite has uh, uh, really um, led us to this point, uh, it's shown us that we cannot with our eyes determine which of these wounds need antimicrobials. So look on the left and you'll see our traditional toolbox um, and all of those uh, instruments and uh, devices in there will be familiar to you. So now we have a new tool that we can use across all of our hygiene strategies. So what, what are the moleculite IX and DX? They are point of care wound imaging devices that enable us to detect bacterial burden in wounds, perform digital wound care measurements. The use of this instrument or device does not involve the use of any contrast agents administered to the patient. There is no patient contact by the instrument and the, uh, the device fits seamlessly into the workflow of the clinic. So this is a precise wavelength of safe violet light that interacts with wound tissue and bacteria. Uh, just this afternoon, um, I had a lady say, I want to shield my eyes because that ultraviolet light uh, might hurt me. And it was an opportunity for me to share with her that this was not ultraviolet light, this is uh, violet light. So this will detect bacterial loads of greater than 10 to the fourth colony forming units per gram of tissue, which again, all of the studies that uh, we'll discuss uh, tonight, if only briefly, um, support that greater than 10 to the fourth is pathogenic. It will uh, identify bacterial loads that fluoresce with specific colors, depending on the pathogen that or the bacteria that is encountered and the individual characteristics of those bacteria. The device also filters out other colors uh, that would add confusion to the picture. 
So again, together with assessment for clinical signs and symptoms, this, uh, um, uh, this is a uh, remarkably useful and valuable tool. So this is what we, and you'll see this when you look at our images, and this is, this is what we see, and it's going to be surprising. And so as we fluoresce the area and we look at the images, when we see this sort of hot white, we call it cyan, it's just a blue-green, uh, it's a hot white color, uh, glowing white, and then it's surrounded usually by a sort of a blue-green halo. That is actually, they have, they have um, the ability to say that, make the claim that that is fluorescing pseudomonas. Uh, when we, what we look for also is this red sort of scarlet blush pink color, and that is indicative of every other kind of bacteria, gram positives, gram negatives, anaerobes, aerobes, and um, certainly something that we go over and you'll, and as we show you our images in our, in our videos, you'll be able to see uh, lots of examples of that. Then the funny thing, the interesting thing that you'll see in the images is that th when you have dry skin and just periwound um, uh, flakes and things, they, they, are look, they look very, very green. Um, uh, thick toenails look bright white. Um, and the, but the interesting thing is like, if you look at this image in the middle, when we're looking at healthy tissue, collagen blood, it turns black. So we'll, we'll point this out as we get to it. But what we look for is the cyan fluorescence with the hot white and the red blush or scarlet or pink uh, coloration in the images. So as we're getting ready to get into talking about is you cannot treat what you cannot see. And this is gonna be uh, remarkable. As you look, this is an image that we took with the moleculite. So let me go back and you see all this dry skin. Look here, this is the actual wound. This is the dry skin surrounding the wound. And you can see all this blush and pink color is bacteria and some of the hotter, the cyan color surrounding it. So clearly as innocuous as that wound looks, this is something that definitely needs some attention. So let's get to the clinical evidence and we'll show the images. All right, we'll go through these uh, uh, fairly quickly. So uh, we, uh, uh, these studies support uh, a couple of things. First of all, point of care fluorescence, fluorescence imaging of bacteria greater than 10 to the fourth CFUs per gram is backed by a lot of scientific evidence. So when, when um, the interesting thing is when we look at this elevated bacterial burden and being able to see them with the fluorescent imaging, uh, it, it led the practitioners to change treatment plans for 69% of the patients. And they felt like being able to see and being able to improve their wound hygiene impacted 85% of those study wounds. So um, this, <clears throat> this particular slide, these studies uh, make three big points. And those are, number one, fluorescence documentation of bacterial presence and locations resulted in more aggressive fluorescence targeted debridement. Number two, these scans enabled proactive wound care and provided immediate feedback on the efficacy of the treatment that we provide and helping to limit the progression of wound related infection and cellulitis. And number three, the elimination of bacterial fluorescence signature with targeted debridement correlated with an average reduction in wound area of almost 28% uh, per week. And I think this middle one is really, to me, what clinically makes the difference is that we get immediate feedback. We can see what we're going right, after right. And, uh, and do something yeah, about just, it. Just this afternoon, Antonio and I had a case where the imaging on the spot changed our plans for treatment. So, so this is looking at a, a group of patients where they looked at one year of standard care retrospectively, and then the second year where they had the, app, um, the option of using the moleculite. And they found in that second year in the, their group of patients, 49% less usage of antimicrobial dressings, 33% less patients required <clears throat> antibiotics, and they had an increase of 23% of their wounds that were healed in 12 weeks. All right, well, now with the buildup, let's take a look at how we actually use this in our clinical practice, starting with how we clean. Getting our first image. So what she's doing right now is she's measuring the wound and taking an image of it so that we can accurately see how big it is. And, uh, so when I measure, I measure with a little ruler 
you know, it only tells me two, two dimensions, the, the length and the width. Okay. okay. So this is telling us in all, all angles. Measuring these kinds of wounds is, is kind of awful because like I was just saying to Paul, we only really measure with, you know, the the most accurate technology in the world, a paper ruler. <laughs> and, um, that you know, we only really get a length and a width. So we're missing all of this good, healthy tissue there. So, so I think that's a, a much better way of going about it. So what's really lighting up is the wound bed right in this area. So he's, uh, you can't really tell, get an appreciation for how much force we're using. You really don't, it doesn't take a lot of scrubbing, but before he starts talking again, um, one of the things that's important is if, if it hurts to clean, no one's gonna clean. And so I think you're using like li lidocaine jelly and things liter uh, liberally. And now we see a lot of the brightness, almost exactly the wound edge. And it looks like it is coming up on the, the gauze. On the gauze. Yeah. <laughs> Change your glass so really, as, as Dot has to say, it really pays to get new gauze every time you wipe. So generally, we try to break up this fibrin. We try to get rid of that through, you know, uh, enzymatic debridement. So we would use a product um, to eat away that dead tissue. But now that I know that there's so much bacteria there, I'm going to start recommending something a little bit different, something to get rid of the bacteria and also to get rid of this yellow fibrous tissue. This is one of our very special patients. We've been taking care of her for a very long time. She has really significant lymphedema. And in our area, we don't have a lymphedema clinic that wants to, or has the capabilities to also do wound care. So we needed to get her, she's already having lymphedema on her right leg. We needed to get her left leg closed before she started. And so we've been using more traditional short stretch wraps in our kits, and but I mean we've had significant reduction, which is evidenced by actually her loose skin at her ankle, but her calf is almost 15 centimeters smaller than it was when we started. It looks like such an innocuous wound. I mean, it doesn't look like anything you get too really concerned about. But um, when we go ahead and do the imaging, uh, then you'll you'll be able to see differently that what you can't see with your eyes surely will show up with the molecular. Lining it up, making sure we focus it, and then capture the picture. And go further. And there's my point. <laughs> you can't tell what you're looking at. So when I'm seeing, when we look at dry skin, this is the typical look to dry skin. And so many of our lower extremity patients have dry skin. And then what you're seeing in the immediate peri wound area is the is the scarlet or the blush colored fluorescence, and that is just indicating that there's bacteria there. And so I'm going to try I'm going to try to wipe it away, but I don't want to cause her oh, actually. And again, you can see where the wound is dark is actually helping the tissue. <laughs> I was able to completely obliterate that because I knew where it was. And then let me see if you can see it on my gauze, but you can see it on the gauze. And a good point about gauze is that, you know, that's a good reason why you want to move your gauze around frequently, but we totally were able to get the rest of that off just by knowing where it was. And uh, that's, that's, that's how we use it. That's what we see every day before and after cleansing. Now this one, you can see the, the bright red uh, fluorescence in the peri wound. And again, what I'll point out is this is good tissue, this darker uh, imaging here. And so what we know is that we've just, and, and I will tell you that macerated tissue soaks in bacteria. Uh, and it, and it, I never really had an appreciation uh, before we had the, the, the uh, moleculite. I'm going to play this again. And I'm sorry, I was holding the device and cleaning. Look at all the, the fluorescence, the red color that's on that gauze. And again, sometimes I'm going at it and just working at it and I'm not paying attention to my hands, but that's, and you'll see this again. But um, uh, so this was before, and this is where we finished after just a few minutes of a pretty vigorous cleansing because we weren't scrubbing his wound, we were scrubbing his peri wound. Now, 
this was that day and you can see there's a lot of fluid and moisture in that tissue and this is so what we made the decision to do is to paint the peri wound with povidone iodine it's not like we were putting it in the wound bed because we know it would be toxic but we were just painting the peri wound and and lee and Haley, our pa will make the decision you know, maybe to use mupirocin, depending on what we might think uh, could be an offending organism without doing a culture. And when we uh, do that, then we put it under, this guy was in a multi-layer wrap um, and uh, just dressed it up. And re remember that all the studies that we have discussed so far tell us that bacterial concentrations greater than 10 to the fourth CFU per gram are pathogenic and remarkably delay wound healing and the moleculite uh, device recognizes and fluoresces at and above mm -hmm. that level of 10 to the fourth. So, uh, you know, when you talk about targeted wound cleaning and targeted hygiene and, and, uh, and, and debridement, uh, you can look real time at uh, the fact that you're removing that bio burden. So we started painting the peri wound with povidone iodine. <clears throat> this was one week later. You can see he already bridged uh, over it. It doesn't look quite as wet as it did before. We have a little bit of fluorescing up here, which is somewhere up in this area and a little bit more, again, just in the peri wound. We did the same thing over again. And then this is a, let me move this. This is a two, two visits later because we were changing his wrap weekly. Um, and you can see he's almost completely closed and he is not fluorescing at all. This was a patient that was just in today. Right. And uh, she looks forward to it. A lot of these patients, they love that when we go, we bring it in, we're gonna turn the lights out and look at their wounds. And I, you know, the reasonable time to just make the point that any time that we're able to help our patients understand what we're doing, uh, the tools that we're using, what do those tools do and help them understand why we're having trouble getting their wound closed, they become much more willing and adherent participants in their own wound care. So what you see here, the dark again is the wound bed itself um, and all this red fluorescence um, uh, showing up around there. So this is a video and again, uh, I might, it might make you a little seasick because I'm holding the device while I'm doing the cleansing, but you can see a couple of things. One, I'm, I'm able to go right after that, that blush color, the red color, but look at the gauze. I'm picking up that bacteria with the gauze. And if I get the, the device over a little bit, you'll see back here where I've taken, you, you know, moved my gauze because you can see the, the bacteria sitting on the gauze. So this doesn't show the entire procedure because it took a few minutes. Um, yeah, look but at that. yeah, yeah. But so that was just one of my images. <clears throat> but over in the right hand picture, this is after this is that very same day after I was finished doing the cleansing. Now we do other kinds of uh, cleansing. We a lot of times use gauze. We also use monofilaments and of course do some debridements with curette. So let's look at that. Now we have this uh, nice gentleman here with us this afternoon who about two and a half weeks ago, accidentally dropped a 50 pound log vertically onto his baby toe. And as we'll see, the toe basically exploded. So imaging studies immediately post-injury revealed uh, technically an open fracture. So a large burst laceration on the extensor aspect of the toe with underlying fractures of the, uh, uh, of the phalanges. Uh, he was seen by orthopedics, referred here for wound care. He has been improving nicely with enzymatic debridement, but because of the risk that's inherent in an open fracture in terms of underlying osteomyelitis, we want to take an extra step today and take a closer look at this. Um, we're going we're gonna to image this now, and then based on the imaging, Dot's going to go ahead and clean this uh, pretty aggressively. Following that, we'll re-image to see where we're at. So I'm get, just getting the photograph. Now, we've already cleaned the wound of any debris or previous dressing residue uh, or any ointments that were there before, so we, which we need to do before we do the fluorescing. 
when I zoom in on it to the average person that would look, well, there's a little bit of clean tissue, but actually that red color is what we want to get rid of on the, in the fluorescing, it should be dark if it's healthy tissue. Sort of aggressive cleansing, vigorous cleansing of this. I'm gonna go ahead and use a little lidocaine jelly uh, for just about five minutes. And that usually is enough to take care of it to make it tolerable. So there's different ways that you can get a wound clean, but if you notice, this is a very small, narrow area. And while I could use gauze, and many times we do use gauze. Uh, what I have as an option is to use a monofilament pad that will uh, use the monofilaments to sort of grab onto debris that's at the surface without me having to press so hard as I would with gauze. And our standard cleanser in this clinic is the hypochlorous acid. And we happen to choose one that's pH balanced and we have a lot of confidence. We use no saline to clean here uh, because again, I'm a freak about wound hygiene. I'm a freak about getting things off the surface of wounds. And so we want to do so safely. So we use a hypochlorous acid to be able to do that. So what I'm going to do, I've already pre-saturated this pad and because I chose, they have a four, but we have four by four pads and then we have this, what's called a lolly. And the one thing that's interesting about these Deborah soft pads, when you put them under the fluorescence, have you ever seen them under fluorescence? They turn really bright white. Sometimes it's hard to even see what's on there. And I would point out that that uh, black spot that appears gangrenous uh, is uh, simply his toenail that has not uh, yet uh, decided to separate what itself. Looking at it, I can still see some of the red imaging, red fluorescing. And, and actually, I'm actually seeing a little bit more, which what that means to me is I got some of the detritus off the surface of the wound. And now we're exposing some of the real tissue, which is really where the bacteria is being harbored. So that would lead us to say, okay, well, it's time to get do a gentle debridement and try to get those surface cells off to try to remove more of that bacteria. So interestingly, after Doc cleansed this uh, wound with a microfiber um, uh, cloth, uh, we actually revealed more bacteria, a greater blush than we had seen pre-cleaning. So I'm gonna take this three millimeter curette and uh, to the extent of this nice guy's tolerance, um, I'm going to gently curette the, uh, the wound bed. We'll then clean it again and re-image to see what we've done. Now we'll image it again after we've done a good cleansing, good wine hygiene, and then a good debridement. And come on. Bingo, almost no fluorescing at all. You know, it's so funny. We've seen these so many times and this is so fun to me just to keep seeing it. So again, <laughs> yeah. before and after. And for those of you who don't live in cold climates, uh, these flannel lined blue jeans that this nice guy had on, <laughs> this is uh, standard fare for upstate New York. So now let's look at our use of ultrasonic debridement. Uh, if you uh, ha are lucky enough to have one of these devices in your, in your, at your disposal, it really makes a big difference. So uh, this is a this very patient special is patient. One, is someone that we know really well. He knows us really well. And he has been coming in for about six months, has venous insufficiency as well as lymphedema. So you can see how much he fluoresced. So what they have figured out with this imaging is that when you see the red or scarlet color is that it is fluorescing possibly gram-positive, gram-negative, anaerobes, aerobes, uh, bacteria that are at, at a number of at least 10 to the four. So we know we have at least 10,000 colony forming units of bacteria uh, per gram of tissue. And so it probably is more superficial than deep seated, but it only becomes deep seated after a while and decides to, you know, to, to invade into the deeper spaces. So. You can't really hear him because of the ultrasound is, is picked up by the microphone, but uh, this actually feels very good to this patient. He uh, he can't get in as often as he wants. There, there's some real issues with transportation and things. Now, it's really not even part of the area. Again, when you think about the mic. So that's before and after. So I, again, uh, I don't think words have to, I don't have to say any more words um, about the what, what has been taken off from that. All right, well, let's take a look at sharp debridement. 
So I, I want to say something as this video starts about this gentleman. It's a below the knee amputation. He has a, a wife with a significant illness that he's on his feet about 16 hours a day. So we have to be very careful about how large we make his wound. And you can see how wow, his look at that red fluorescence peel off. This is just such a good illustration of the fact that the peri wound callus uh, tends to be even more saturated with bacteria than uh, peri wound ma mas macerated tissue or, or plain skin. Callus is just like a sponge, it just yeah. soaks it in. <laughs> So, so I think most of what we identified as fluorescing bacteria before we started is now pretty well gone. Um, what I'm wondering is whether the, the area at the 12 o'clock position here, whether that's bright granulation tissue that's just showing up because of the light. Uh, I'm going to try to just just gently fillet that. No, that was bacteria. We can flip it off. No, oh, there that, you go. that was bacteria. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Good, right? <laughs> Should we get all that off of there? Interesting thing that we've learned is that it's not only bacteria within the wound bed that interferes with healing but bacteria in the periphery, which is specifically bed, which is my what we just took off today. So with him, we, we do leave a little because we can't make his wound. Uh, we, we have to just be careful. There's a balance with this gentleman because he has to wear his prosthesis so many hours in a day. And, you know, it's yeah, so it's like rubber again. <laughs> so it's just it's pretty down in there. Um, and actually, I can see a little bit more than is showing up on the image, but um, but I, I have a lot of confidence by this time next week that's mostly going to be gone, and we'll just take some more imaging next week. Yeah, and his wound is continuing to get smaller. And and just another illustration of how important it is for us to understand uh, the this patient's gentleman came situation to see us at home. Some time ago, uh, with what was previously and still is really an unstageable pressure injury because of at that point, a very hard black eschar. So I cross-hatched it with a scalpel at that point, and uh, we started him on uh, enzymatic debridement with collagenase, and ultimately it softened up to this point, and that's what we were hoping for, uh, to a point where we'll be able to excise this eschar and then uh, hopefully be able to stage it and begin uh, some more definitive treatment. So what we see here is a perfect image. You see all that bright white, which is indicative of pseudomonas, which sort of matches the uh, odor that's coming from the wound. And then we see the scarlet color indicating bacteria, but this wound is so necrotic, we know that it's gonna be a mixed bag of bacteria. So our goal now is to get rid of that. So we're gonna start with a sharp debridement and then move on to an ultrasound debridement. So what we, can, what we can see now at this point is that this unstageable pressure injury has now, uh, we're now able to see the wound bed. So we're able to say definitively that this is a stage four with the exposed muscle and tendon. Good bone. I, I, I haven't seen or touched bone yet, but it's certainly not far away. <laughs> so you, this is, a, a, clearly there's going to be bacteria there, but it doesn't fluoresce like you might expect. Um, And, uh, and you always want to do a good cleansing after any debridement. So that's our before and after. A little bit of blush over onto the three o'clock position, three or four o'clock position. But um, anyway, we were able to get him clean. Um, we use ultrasound debridement with him also. And um, then I think he's 
working on negative pressure now. Right. And, and now we're actually able to get effective wound treatment to the bed of the wound. All right. Now, one of the, one of the really fun things that was really eye-opening is something I'm sure you all do, and we lovingly call it toe flossing, because what is harbored in between people's toes is alarming. And uh, I mean, I think there's actually a study being done looking at people who have diabetes and looking at the uh, imaging uh, of between their toes. But uh, we'll give you a couple of examples of this. So um, this first one is- and so I'm gonna show you how I like to clean toes, but I first wanted to make sure, because since he has a wound right here, it would be easy for uh, bacteria to get caught between the toes. So let me, there is a little. This is the gentleman we looked at already, but what's going between his toes? Yeah. So we lovingly call this toe flossing. And I have a uh, hypochlorous acid on that gauze, it's wet. Um, so I'm just gonna bring this between his toes because it's gentle. Uh, we don't have to separate the toes so far. And then what you get out of a lot of patients between their in the web space of their toes is a lot of dry skin. Like he has a little bit here. Uh, All right. So uh, again, a little more toe fluff. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. This is my favorite one. Look at the fluorescence that's between this fellow's toes. We're actually working on a venous ulcers with this man, but uh, he had a little bit of uh, a sore callus. And um, watch, uh, this is gonna go through this middle video again. Look at the amount of bacteria that's stuck on that gauze as we bring that through. This is not Hollywood uh, uh, <laughs> alien uh, movie. This is in Saratoga Springs, New York. <laughs> But see, it's on his third toe. His second toe is quite deformed. Um, but jumping to the chase, what's left here on that right-hand picture is, is or image is, is actually uh, the wet callus that was left behind. It was getting a little tender, but how? look how well, just using um, hypochlorous acid on gauze, sliding it through and uh, flossing, if you will, we were able to get that clean. Now, this is another example. This is uh, using our ultrasound on the same patient. They, it was on different days. So, uh, but you can, what I, why I wanted to include this is I was, somebody was holding the device for me. I was really trying to get all this dry skin from between his toes, but look at my fingers, look at the gauze and how much bacteria is there as we're cleaning this. And so we went, again, it just makes the point change out your gauze frequently as you're doing cleansing on these folks. And when I move my hand one more time, that right hand, that top hand, you'll see behind him all of that fluorescing gauze that was in the tray underneath his feet on our, in our uh, podiatry chair. And then this is using the ultrasound again, which makes it a whole lot easier. <clears throat> and you can just see all of that just flowing off of the surface of the wound. So now let's uh, again finish looking at the imp absolutely importance of cleansing the peri wound area. So this this gentleman here, you can see uh, it looks not too bad. Uh, there's some dry skin around the area, a little maceration, but look when we imaged him. And I would tell you that, sorry to interrupt, that's okay. that I think 10 out of 10 providers would look at this with their eyes and say, that's a nice looking clean pink wound and you really would not give a second thought Maybe about, just other than about cleaning uh, stuff away, yeah. bio burden, right? Especially not about bio burden. <clears throat> but after we imaged him, you can see the uh, the cyan, you can see the hot white uh, right. imaging. And so all we did, this didn't take any kind of special cleansing. Uh, I generally, when it's more moist maceration like this, I'll generally use a dry gauze in that to try to sort of wipe it away. Uh, we peeled away some of this other dry skin here. And this is his after cleansing image. And you can see we got rid of all of it. So it is possible to do, and it doesn't have to take a lot of time. I'm a, I'm, 
I, when we interview nurses uh, to come to work in our clinic, I ask if they like to pick scabs and to pick scales. And if they say yes, then that's a big plus because we have to get rid of these things. Now, this gentleman, his entire lower extremity had this thick, crusty scales on it. And it's not something we can many times do in a single sitting. You can see over here in the imaging that uh, the dry skin shows up green, but there was a lot of fluorescence around the, the periphery of the wound, you'll see that. But this was one of the scales that I peeled off. And this is why we need to get rid of them. They are harboring bacteria. <clears throat> if you've ever peeled off one of those waxy scales, you can see sometimes there's a little maceration underneath it. We have to get rid of them. So, and again, when these people come with a lot of scales, it's not always going to happen in one city, but it's something we certainly should work towards. So this is uh, the same guy. This is, uh, again, Haley, our PA is, uh, sometimes the, the fluorescence will go off and we have to turn it back on. But I'm um, just showing you a little bit of her working on that peri wound area. Again, you see how bright white, although uh, well, that, that looks bright white, but that's just the way some toenails and some really thick uh, scales show up. So, but uh, she's uh, working on it there. And then you can see this is after, same day after cleansing. And again, an absence of the fluorescence. It's such a, it's so rewarding and such a good feeling when it happens. All right. Well, that was fun. It's over already. That yeah. was fun. <laughs> I love looking at those, those images and those videos. We've looked at them as we've put all this together so many times. And that was, I hope it was, I hope you enjoyed it and that it, it was meaningful for you. So just a few closing remarks, you know, being able to see what you're doing is actually going to save time in the overall cleansing process, because it helps us to focus on what we need to do and optimize the removal of the bacteria. Uh, agree. Agree. And I, uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, back to these uh, stages of learning and education that we've all heard about, uh, and the, the lowest of which is uh, that you don't know what you don't know. And uh, I, I realize, you know, after having done this full time for the last 15 years and thinking that I was pretty good at it, and then realizing that there is uh, that that there is a whole new technology that allows me to see what I was not able to see and that that technology blends sort of seamlessly into our workflow, ah, it's such a game changer. So critical learning points for us, and I've already emphasized this, is that we want to look at the peri wound or think about the peri wound, think about the impact that the wound hygiene concept has made and that we want to clean 10 to 20 centimeters around the pair, the wound, or at least where the previous dressing was sitting, uh, as well as change your gauze frequently. Think about all the <laughs> debris that we fluoresced on the gauze that we were using to clean. Clean, uh, remove scales. We know they harbor bacteria. If we get scales off and if we want to treat the skin with, say, a mid potency steroid ointment or just an emollient, do you want to treat scales or do you want to treat skin? So we know that those scales, and, and we've been able to see this so visually with the moleculite, the scales are harboring bacteria. So we want to get rid of them. Uh, I will tell you that maceration is, is an evil. It will harbor bacteria. It fluoresces almost 100% of the time. So good wound, um, uh, actually date management, protecting the peri wound skin so that it's not, it doesn't have uh, moisture sitting on the skin will help to reduce that maceration. And then it, your patients will love it. I mean, they, they get very engaged in this. <clears throat> First of all, they understand why cleansing is important. It helps them understand when we make a decision on the treatment plan or are able to stop, uh, say, an antimicrobial dressing, but it really gets them involved. We take the image and we show it to them, and they ha it helps them to understand that we're really looking out for them and we're taking this to the nth degree in order to, uh, to make sure that we're, we're beating the biofilm and beating the bacteria uh, war, if you will. So with that, <clears throat> that was fun, Dr. Nancy. Thank you, Ms. Weir. <laughs> So now we're ready to hear from you and to answer your questions. But before we do, let's do a little poll. Were you surprised at the bacterial loads and locations then covered with the addition of the fluorescent imaging to the wound assessment routine that we, that we outlined for you? So uh, it's an easy answer, either yes or no.
Okay, what a great session we had there. Um, so we're excited to have Dot and Lee here for questions uh, today. And let's dig into some of those questions. Uh, first, uh, we have a question about uh, surgical site wounds. Dot and Lee, you, you showed us quite a few chronic wounds. Can you comment on whether you can use this device on surgical site wounds? Yes, from, from my perspective, uh, uh, in terms of surgical wounds, we'd be, we'd be comfortable using this on surgical dehiscences and other, sites, uh, other types of problematic surgical wounds. Um, we'd, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't, given especially that it is a contactless technology, um, we, we, uh, we wouldn't have any risk of, uh, of entering a body compartment that would be underneath the wound, which is, which is a risk when you're using, when you're using tools. But uh, no, th this uh, would be perfectly compatible with, and we have used it for surgical dehiscences uh, along the way. But if you're talking about like intact surgical incisions, we don't see those. Right. <laughs> so, but you certainly could. We, we don't see surgical wounds unless they've fallen apart. <laughs> Okay, and I understand there is a uh, a presentation at uh, WoundCon tomorrow in the in the Moleculite booth on surgical site wounds. So uh, perhaps that person can can check out that presentation tomorrow. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, oh, sure. An sure. Another question that's come in is um, about workflow. So they're they're asking specifically around debridement. When in relation to debridement would you typically take this? Uh, would you typically do your imaging? Well, we do it before uh, we've done the cleaning. We do it before they start the debridement. And many times, as you saw in the videos, they, they are actually doing their debridement under the fluorescence so that they can really focus on where the image is showing us um, that, that there is bacteria there. So it's, it's pretty much before, during, and after uh, you can use the, the imaging. It's, it's, it's um, and uh, you just have to put the lights off. So uh, it, it's really before, during, and after. I I agree. the the uh, The device actually guides uh, our debridement of uh, of area loaded tissue. Excellent. Um, a question's just come in asking whether the device shows live as well as dead bacteria. And I'll actually take that one if you don't mind, uh, Dot and Lee. No, please, uh, because yeah. this is. Because this is showing a byproduct of metabolism, this is only going to show live bacteria. So dead fluorescent, uh, dead bacteria will not fluoresce. And, and thanks very much for that great question. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And another uh, another question coming in uh, that I'm going to handle is whether or not there's reimbursement for the moleculite uh, device. And um, I'm assuming that question is coming in from the United States. So there is reimbursement in the United States for this. There are two CPT codes specific to this technology uh, for non-contact, real-time fluorescence imaging of bacterial presence, location, and load. Uh, and uh, the um, you can check the uh, local fee schedules for the payment amounts uh, associated with this technology. Okay, so moving on to moving on. Two, um, how can I solve maceration around the wound? Great question. Can you comment, uh, Dot and Lee? <clears throat> yes. Uh, maceration, obviously, is just moisture, and so you're making every effort to change your treatment plan to better handle the moisture, uh, which is not always possible. It's not always easy. There are very good products, super absorbent dressings, that can wick exudate out and into a secondary dressing. So uh, just working hard at that. Uh, past that, utilizing um, uh, you know one of the polymer skin preps or one of the cyanoacrylates to better protect the skin. But one thing we have learned absolutely 100% is that macerated tissue, macerated skin, and especially macerated callus just holds on and soaks in bacteria. Uh, so it's really uh, you know, and and many times like for a venous leg ulcer, if you have a lot of edema. Uh, that it's a little harder to manage, but as soon as you get the compression started and the volume of the leg down, usually the exudate will slow down. So uh, it's really probably more of a, a, a choosing a product that will handle the exudate better. Agreed. 
Um, we have a question that's come in from Nigeria, and they're asking when performing okay. wound hygiene, when would you introduce irrigation fluid to try and reduce that bacterial burden? As far as irrigation fluid, I am not sure how they're asking because there are devices that can irrigate the wound bed. We we a hundred percent of the time use a hypochlorous acid um, to either uh, flush or irrigate. If it's a cavity area, then we will irrigate with the brush. If it's a um, if it's a surface, then we'll scrub with it, clean with it. Um, so I, I think using fluids effectively. Uh, that was what I mentioned, um, you know, dribbling some saline onto a wound and blotting it dry is not going to be effective. So uh, irrigating with whatever um, solution that you have that will, uh, you know, be effective against the bacteria. And if you don't think there's bacteria there, like if it doesn't fluoresce, fluoresce then, um, it, you know, because we have the ability to see that, then we could just use a standard wound cleanser. But we don't use spray wound cleansers in our clinics. We just have the high course acids. And, and I'll just add uh, to that, uh, although it's not technically irrigation, but ultrasonic debridement uh, also with the water flow um, is a useful uh, is a useful adjunct for irrigation if you have access yeah. to ultrasonic debridement. Okay, thanks very much. And... Let's see, we have some more questions coming in uh, quite quickly uh, here. And actually, shall we move to the poll uh, to, uh, let's just take a look at what the, what the polling question um, asked. So we had, were you surprised at the bacterial loads and locations uncovered by the addition of fluorescence imaging to the wound assessment machine? Uh, Dot and Lee, do you see those results? We had 83% came back with a yes. What do you think about that? Uh, oh. oh, there it is. Okay. That makes me very happy <laughs> that they were surprised with because hopefully enlightening them with, with our imaging and the, um, the cases that we shared will, you know, make a positive impact in, in their cleaning um, uh, practices. But, you know, uh, to me, I think this, this device, until you actually have an opportunity to use it and see what it does, it, it it seems a little bit too magical, um, and and so uh, I'm not I'm not surprised to see that uh, 83 percent were surprised uh, at uh, the ability to fluoresce that bacteria. That's uh, that's cool. And I'm surprised still every every single day because <laughs> you just yeah. you just don't know what you can't see. But really, the toe flossing and what 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 we were able to image on that gauze, I, I think, are huge take home messages. Um, uh, just, you know, cleaning well, switching out your gauze frequently. If you're using a monofilament pad or a lolly, then, then that, you know, just you, you're changing that around usually anyway. And, you know, to, to the uh, points made in some of the, some of the studies that have been done, uh, yesterday alone we had, uh, we had two cases in which the fluorescence imaging uh, changed our, uh, our treatment plan basically on the fly. Fantastic. Let's tuck in two more questions. We've got a great one about biofilm, um, asking whether or not uh, Moleculite is able to detect wound biofilm. And I think you mentioned some of those studies in the presentation, um, Lee, talking about the uh, in vivo and the in vitro evidence for detecting wound biofilm. Can you comment on how this has impacted your biofilm strategies uh, in terms of hygiene? Well, yeah. Sure. And, and I, I think the, the interesting thing is um, the the uh, the data and the literature are pretty solid that we really can't with our naked eyes we cannot see we cannot visualize biofilm. We know that we need to debride well in order to get rid of biofilm, but we aren't really able to see with our eyes whether we're getting the biofilm or how much of it we're getting. So the addition of fluorescence imaging allows us to be sure that we're not just getting the surface and the planktonic bacteria, but that we're also able to, uh, uh, to get the biofilm that's, that's encased in that protective uh, extra polymeric uh, uh, substance. So yeah, I, I think that's, that's a really uh, an important concept. 
And one more question I think is really important here. Does a high level of bacterial burden translate automatically into wound infection? I think I imagine you'll have some some comments on that. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we, and we are very um, specific with our patients when we share their image with them because they want to see it, and I think it's important for them to see it to understand what we're trying to accomplish, is that this does not diagnose anything. It's not diagnosing an infection. It's letting us know where the bacteria are uh, in a higher, at least like we've said, 10 to the fourth or 10,000 colony forming units um, so that we can um, do a better job of cleansing that area. So, uh, it, it doesn't automatically say that the wound is infected. You're still going to use your clinical signs and symptoms to uh, decide uh, then to culture uh, and, and treat with, but this, again, gives us the ability to cleanse with consent. Um, right. Um, agree with all the, <laughs> agree with all the above. Excellent. Well, we have actually run to the end of our time. So for anyone who we weren't able to get to your question. We apologize for running out of time. Thanks for submitting all the great questions. Thank you for attending uh, this webinar today. And thank you so much to, uh, to uh, Dodd and Lee for this fantastic presentation around uh, wound hygiene. It was so fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much.